on the agenda is. What am I doing? Sorry. I managed to bury the agenda at that point. <coughs> um, item five, the land use um, recovery plan. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, the land use recovery plan update. And um, we've got um, Mike and, and Richard at the end of the table. So, um, has anyone got any questions that? They'd like to direct the staff on the on the report that we've got. Um, Andrew Turner. Thank you. Um, referring to um, six point one point five, can we find out, please, um, who are our representatives on that steering group? Who actually attends that steering group for council? Certainly, um, through you, Madam Chair. It is um, Ron Clark um, in the City Environment Group. Carolyn Gallagher in Community Services, myself in Strategy and Planning, and I'm also the Chair, and Sharon Threadwell in the Building Services team. Thank you. Um, uh, Phil Clearwater. Um, just in relation to um, on page 5, 6.16 in terms of your recommendation, the work that's ongoing explaining the work to the community it just seems to me, what, while, for example, um, the district plan is, has been well, um, there are many, many um, workshops on that for the community, but, but the, the part of the LERP in that, it just doesn't seem to me to be, there haven't been specific, I guess, information often to the community, and that's come up in the workshops that I've attended. So just wonder if you could explain perhaps about, well, what we are doing, but also how we might be able to enhance that as council. Through you, Madam Chair, you, as you're aware, the, the LERP itself has been gazetted by the Minister and that occurred on 6th of December last year and there were a couple of rounds of consultation prior to that occurring. So at the moment, the work that we've done is really explaining it to um, the details of what's in it to professional institutes. Um, we've done presentations to some of those thus far. We've created information seat, sheets to answer some of the questions that people have about the specific provisions within it but we're not going through an active uh, additional consultation plan because that was done in 2013. But there's certainly still some ongoing work, but nothing in comparison with what's happening on the district plan with you, review. Right, perhaps just picking up, I think, on your um, sentiment, Councillor Clearwater, and that is, um, so I think I gather what you're saying is, so how do we better connect what we're talking about in the city plan to some of the LERP drivers that are leading us down that. So that's something we can take up in our, in our consultation programs on the district plan and make sure those linkages are perhaps a bit more explicit because the LERP, uh, along with the previous district plan and the UDSR, are key drivers into the review, so uh, we can pick those up. Obviously the district plan is one part of the LERP, say on, so on the exemplar projects we're having a lot of conversations, as Richard said, with those people who are involved in those specifically. Thank you, Mike, because I think the, the community reaction is that they had no idea really of the power of, of the powerful influence of the LERP on, I guess, their, their democratic opportunities to comment on the, the district plan. Uh, Jimmy Chen. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Regarding to the uh, staff recommendation 6.1.1, uh, here mentioned a minister, you know, may undertake a minor amendment as attachment one. Whether the council has been engaged with the Sierra Star and they report to the minister, they all agree this minor amendment, especially in attachment one. So the attachment one just indicates some minor amendments to the, the statutory provisions that were um, introduced through the land use recovery plan, and, and most of them are pretty minor issues. I mean, some of them are as small as capitals and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the minister has indicated he would like a, a, a process to, you know, a, a single process to, to make changes to those. So council is one of those parties. There, there's probably um, some minor amendments that might need to be made in terms of WIMAC, Selwyn District as well. Yeah. So 
we're not quite sure at the moment in terms of how that process is going to um, you know, end up, but, but basically those are the ones that we have identified within council. So, but it'll be the minister's decision as to whether he makes them. Um, uh, Glenn Livingston and then Ali Jones. Thank you. I have uh, two questions, if I may. The first is around the community housing redevelopment mechanism, in reference to page eleven, where the what has been struck out is the uh, uh, residential units are proposed, uh, where there would be a mix of at least two unit size types. So I'm I'm just querying why in the in the bullet point. At the beginning of the report, it says that uh, this flexibility, which we had if it went through, would in fact turn to kind of suppress their own flexibility when it came to uh, housing New Zealand. Are you able to just tease this out a bit? Is this a kind of a push towards homogeneity, or why isn't there this kind of flexibility in, in the typology? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, this is obviously a decision that the, the minister made. Um, it's hard, hard to know. I mean, it, it may be. It may suggest more uniformity than we otherwise anticipated. It may also be that um, um, the, the minister decided that he didn't want to be bound by that level of prescription. Um, it doesn't foreclose that mix happening, but it doesn't specify it either. So, you know, it's hard, hard to know, but I mean, certainly when we look at what Housing New Zealand are talking about, they, they continue to develop a mix of housing types in their proposals, but um, yeah. Well, thank you. The second question is about the uh, Wairaki uh, proposal there, and we can see the grey area representing the uh, uh, operative loop <coughs> HRM, and my question there is that the uh, seems to me there are two quite different communities of interest that are being put together that um, distinctly laid out in the red and, and then the blue. Um, do you know the, the reasoning for that? Um, well, I think, I think the, perhaps the question's relevant to, to all of those areas. The Minister, um, as we understand it, uh, when he took uh, the final agreed versions that the Council had offered uh, and a significantly larger area of land incorporated. Um, I think at the end of the day, the, the blue line was um, a compromise that the Minister was able to reach with his Cabinet colleagues. I can't answer specifically why um, he chose um, that particular area. We certainly had some discussion with his officials around what were, um, if things were going to change, because they were there was a direction from Cabinet to change, how we would... Um, what sort of boundaries we would best work with. Uh, and so the outcome for all those areas where there's been some expansion has been, a, I suppose, a, a, um, a sort of a solution that's been derived based on Cabinet's intention to grow the areas slightly. It did kind of look to me like it was, um, it was, it was just to create a, an impression on the map that there was a... A bigger... A, bi bigger a line, area. you know, but, that, you know, that the line made sense. Yeah. That's what it looked like. Well, well some, some of them are, um, in some respects, and I, I don't know the communities particularly well in that area, but some of them are sort of taking them out to p potentially more logical boundaries, more understandable edges, but some of them... But the fundamental driver was a reflection by Cabinet that they wanted to have a larger amount of land incorporated in that, that function. Mm. Uh, Ali? Thank you. I just I had a question around, and I appreciate this has been gazetted, and, and but I would, just for clarification around the elderly um, persons housing, because I understand that this was raised actually some weeks ago, if not months ago, uh, when it became clear that clause E related to the phone. And I'm sorry, I've been working on electronic and paper, and the page numbers don't seem to align. Um, I've got page nine down on my electronic note. That's right. Attachment two, thank yep. you. Um, so the changes to the elderly person's housing, and it was point E that was completely struck out, which was the issue that councillors talked about with regards to protecting those over 60s who had bought into an environment that they had assumed would remain. Mm. Uh, and all it did was essentially allow there to be a degree of democracy, if you like, around approval of removing those boundaries so that other people 
could come in and live in there. Now, my understanding was when this first became clear that this had been removed, it was raised and taken back to uh, the minister, or I think it was the minister, and it was suggested that that hadn't been removed. Now, I think I had a conversation with, with Leanne at some stage on this, and that, um, and so I understood that it hadn't been removed, and now I see that it has been removed, and in fact there are no barriers to anyone moving into over 60s housing. Is that correct? The, this was a, um, the, the, this was a uh, it, one of the issues that we wanted to discuss with the minister. So we wanted to, uh, you know, have a meeting to talk about the changes that had been made, um, and and so with you know, delays in getting that, that meeting established, it wasn't possible to do so. And so I spoke to Sarah's staff about what was behind this decision, as you say, it was gazetted. Um, that the position that they put to me was that it is unnecessary to write in the requirement for written approval, because all of these have, um, oh, what are they called? Um, uh, Body corporate. Covenants. Covenants. Mm. No, they have covenants which are legally binding that you have to be um, over 60 to live there. It does, you don't have to be over 60 to um, own, oh, no. but you have to be over 60 to live there. That, that is the, the covenant that goes with it. So in actual fact, and this is where perhaps um, I, I, don't, I don't recall saying to you that they'd changed their mind, that they hadn't, they said that this wording was unnecessary to provide the protection that the council wanted to place, which gave me much more comfort than I had uh, when I um, position necessary to of all because it is a covenant that is an enf enforceable by the by the group, and so, so they would. The 2.3.9 under occupancy of an elderly person's housing unit, does it make clear in the living one, two, and living eight zones an elderly person's housing unit existing at etc. etc. may be converted to a residential unit that may be occupied by any persons? Well, it doesn't overrule the covenant that exists on the property, and so they would have to agree. That's that 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 is what I've been advised by so Sarah. What's the point but of what would having that in there? I don't understand why you would have a paragraph that essentially opens it up to anyone living. When because that is at the out moment the they don't have the power to do that. They even they couldn't they couldn't use if they agreed to let go of their covenant. Yeah. Then the basis under the district plan for them having elderly persons units would disappear. So they can't legally do it until this was put in the district plan. So they, they, they I mean, even if every single person agrees in a unit now without this plan change, they weren't allowed to. Under the district plan, it was only available for people who were over 60. I understand that. What I don't understand is the, the suggestion that it's already there and is a protection, and yet in 2.3.9, there doesn't appear to be that protect, protection unless the covenant. Yeah, all I'm telling you, this. all I'm telling you yeah. is that that's what I received by way of advice from Sarah. So I'll hand back to Mike, and so I, I mean, he might say I totally disagree with no, that no, advice. No, no, no. I think I think the key the key thing that we need to recognise is. Um, the, the, the clause you're talking to refers to developments going forward. Uh, e, as was around protecting existing developments where people had bought in with the, um, the expectation that they weren't going to be exposed to people of different age groups or what have you. However, as, as Leanne has rightly pointed out, even new ones, if, 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 a, if a group of landowners decided through their body corporate to restrict their occupancy to older persons or to left-handed people, they're entitled still to do it. So the protection was very much around what protects currently. So people, and that was the debate I think we had around the table with councillors, was about protecting existing people. So uh, that's reliant on the existing body corporate. The new rules for new developments are more flexible, but it doesn't stop people establishing a body corporate covenant relationship that pertains as over 60. But forgive me for sounding obtuse, I, I still don't understand what that first paragraph there provides for. 
I mean, I, it, at the moment, you can't have a development with residential units this size that aren't elderly persons units. That was the pre-existing one. That's what right. I'm saying. Yep, no, I understand. Yeah. So yeah. to have um, it available for um, others other than elderly persons, we needed this rule change. This adds more flexibility. This is only about... The, the, the protection was only for pre-existing ones. Right. Okay. But this is the advice that we've received, but I think that what I'm hearing is it'd be useful to get um, written advice from Sarah to confirm their their position. Yeah. So and, and that is actually something that I think would be useful. Thank so you. if you could make a note of that, Mike, that would be great. Can I just follow up on that point? So for those units that are elderly persons housing now, um, in terms of protecting them, is there always a body corporate? I mean, I suppose the, the answer is there should be, but there may be instances where there haven't been. Okay. But, but in the majority of cases, and, and by intent, there should be. Oh, yeah. um, sorry, I should also point out that under the temporary OIC, there's a current exclusion as well, but that does expire. OK, so for those that exist, they can still, if they wish to, Electricity. under their covenant, keep um, whoever they want to within that community. Yes. yes. And not allow new ones in. Yep. Um, but for going forward, for we see advertised, you know, suitable for four elderly persons units or whatever, those can be for now anybody's units. Is that the major change? Yes, yes. unless they choose to enforce that again through some form of um, uh, legal document to, to create that same exclusion. But for a developer taking a relatively small um, section yep. and putting four yes. units on, they can now be for anyone. Student yes. flats, right. whatever. Thank you very That's much correct. indeed. Yep. Yep. Yanni. I just want to pick up on this point because when you read 2.3.9, it actually talks about existing units, not new ones. It's about converting to residential units, existing units. So I have no confidence. Um, you know, I just find that we, we know what the Minister's intention was. We had discussions with them as we prepared the land use recovery plan. We knew that Sarah and the Minister did not like having any controls on what people, people being able to live in elderly persons' housing. We had that debate, we had an agreement, and when the report came to Council, I thought we'd had agreement that the changes that we'd made were supported. So the fact that they've been changed after we had an agreement really sits uncomfortably with me. Now we've heard that there's kind of bizarre reasons why they've so it's unnecessary, but if they thought it was unnecessary, why wouldn't they just leave it in and say, well, we didn't think you needed to do it, but if it gives you greater comfort, then we're happy to have it in there. It was the, it was the specific um, wording, which was the written approval. Mm. And I don't think it's, it's bizarre when we haven't received the advice in writing. So let's get the advice in writing, which we've already agreed to do. Um, and in terms of the existing units, I think that the point that has been made is that it would not be legally possible under our existing um, district plan to allow to allow them by consent to agree to this without without um, without a change to our district plan, which is what the LERP has done. It's changed the district plan to allow this to happen. So yes, it's a, it's to do with existing units. What we've been advised orally is that. The, um, the covenants that people enter into about who can live in these units. And I know that this, is, this occurs throughout the city because I had people approaching me about, you know, a, a, a guy inherited his mother's um, unit in one of these complexes after she died. He wasn't allowed to live there even though every single people person in the unit was more than happy, in the set of units, was more than happy that he did. Yeah, but I mean, he was I, I under 60. We've, we've had this debate, we had this debate as part of the LERP being, you know, us giving support to the LERP. We were really clear as a council about what our bottom lines were. Um, and I just feel that it's, you know, though that, that agreement that we had has been broken. Um, I was interested, Michael, in your comments that um, you were aware that Cabinet were making changes to the wider area. And I just was wondering why that never came back to us as elected members, given that one of the major issues we discussed was the concern about the extent of the areas that removes effectively the right for the public to be involved. And we had very detailed maps around the number of privately owned houses versus uh, publicly owned 
and we actually had agreement on those areas. And I was really surprised to hear you say that you, the staff were aware that um, you knew the Cabinet was going to look at bigger areas and it never came back to us, given that that's fundamentally something that we decided, again, as agreeing to the LERP. Uh, can I be very clear? I didn't say we knew Cabinet was considering it. We were advised Cabinet had made a decision and we were asked for our advice about how that those final boundaries would be drawn up. So Cabinet had made the decision to extend the areas. Right. I'm, af I'm afraid that the process has been unsatisfactory, so let's yeah. just accept that. Well, it, no, is, it has accept been unsatisfactory to the extent that we agreed as a council that we would accept um, uh, the LERP. We signed up to it. We set up a smaller group of people to meet uh, with the Minister to negotiate the outstanding matters, uh, and, uh, and that meeting didn't occur, and it went to Cabinet before, a, um, before any such meeting could occur. We have met subsequently to discuss um, the order in Council and, uh, and, and some aspects of this, but but not all aspects of this. We, and unfortunately, what has been missing has been a report um, generated out of a meeting with the Minister on these particular matters, and it just simply hasn't happened. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accept you know, my share of the responsibility for this. There's nothing I can do about it. The meeting simply didn't take place. It kind of calls into question our whole working relationship with government. If we cannot have a meaningful good faith discussion and agreement on doing things where this is what happened with the cost share, it's what happened with the blueprint, it's now happened with the land use recovery plan. You know, it's just, it, I, I don't accept it. I think it's completely unacceptable that we are constantly put in this position. It is unfair to our communities who actually are losing democracy. This is about doing things to communities rather than enabling them to be involved. And I feel very strongly that at some stage we need to stand up and say we do not support these processes. Can I just ask the final question, is when is the Order and Council going to be made public so that the community can see what the Minister is intent on doing in terms of the district plan review? Because that is critical to the people. We've got hearings next week and we still don't have any publicity around the process that Government have decided we will have happen to our communities. So when will it be made public? And what is the communications around it? We, we don't have a confirmed date yet from the Crown. Yeah. Next week. Well, we, we, we may have to start. revisit that. Hearings, just to be careful. We, our meetings hearings. start next week yes. yep. to take into account community feedback. Yes. And the community have no idea what the Order and Council that Government have done says. In light of that, it may be that we have to revisit what we are doing next week. So, um, you know, I'm... The, the, this is, um, yeah, there, there are enormously um, challenging issues, as, uh, and I just want to kind of go back just a, 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 a moment in time to last year when it became very clear that uh, with a new council being briefed on the government's intention around uh, residential intensification and the design led uh, proposal. Uh, the, I'm certainly I had uh, completely misunderstood what the government's intention was. That once um, we had had, well, a group of us had had a meeting with the minister, I became much clearer in my own mind what the government was actually proposing. And you might recall a meeting that we had with the minister, uh, um, where all of us were present, and we we heard really what the alternative was and the explanation that I was able to make to the Minister that the difficulty that the Council was confronted with was that we couldn't talk about what the government wanted to achieve in terms of completely rewriting the district plan for intensification virtually across the city um, as an alternative to us having um, some democratic input from the residents of Christchurch around specific um, intensification proposals that were, as we said, design-led, you know, to be um, sensitive to the environment, particularly in those living zone one, uh, living one 
zones where people were going to be, um, you know, needed to have a buffer, as it were, between a more intense um, environment where there was uh, significant chunks of land ownership. And so, and that, that um, and out of that meeting, the, the, the minister um, allowed us to talk publicly about the alternatives. And I thought that was an incredible step forward. And I believed that it was the beginning of a new relationship with central government, something that I hadn't observed as an outsider looking in between um, the elected members of this council and central government. I thought it was a major breakthrough. So I know that people are going to express, um, you know, sort of <sighs> disappointment about some of the, the, the detail of the, um, of the changes that were made subsequently. But when I reflect on if the government had not waited for the new council to be elected, then we would have had the entire district plan rewritten and it would have included intensification right across the city. And in fact, would have even picked up areas where we would have had um, constraints on <laughs> sewage and water <laughs> delivery, which would have had massive impacts on the capacity for our city um, and, and no mechanism for resolving that. So uh, look, I'm not, I'm not sitting here um, being an apologist for anything other than there was a previous history which has, is, which was deep um, seated, and we are in a process of moving the relationship forward. And I think we've made significant advances. I would, um, but it is clear that there are aspects of the um, the next phase, which are, you know, the fact that the order in council isn't um, ready yet, and that there are possibly reasons sitting behind that, that we may have to rethink the whole process on our district plan review. Because I think the question that Phil Clearwater raised before has really highlighted an issue, which is the public don't see the connection between the land use recovery plan and what the, the government's intentions are around intensification, which we now see are, are bigger than, than where we had agreed. And, um, and secondly, um, there, the, the district plan review. And there is a high level of connection because one is driven off the other. But what, what's been difficult for me coming in from a, as an outsider coming in here is that my driver has been around the natural hazards chapter and I'm, I'm not satisfied that the public truly understand the nature of the risks and the mechanisms that are available to a council under a district plan to address those risks and what the shared responsibility is between the populations that are exposed to those risks, the wider community and the costs of addressing some of those and how on earth we get to a, a, a sort of almost like a shared learning and understanding of what their roles are. Um, as a city going forward. And I, you know, it is a hugely challenging issue, but I don't think that we can do justice to it in the time frame that we now are under because of the um, fast tracking process, which, I mean, I'd love to use the fast tracking at the end because I'd really like to not go through five years of hearings and appeals and further hearings and further appeals. I would really like to, though, spending a, a lot more time with community having input. And that's now, for me, not just the natural hazards chapter, but it's the residential chapter and the commercial and the industrial, um, and in fact a combination of them, because I still think that there may be some sense in having a, a Wollstone chapter, for example, to deal with the multiplicity of issues that all integrate in one in one place, but I'm sure that the expert planners are looking at me uh, rather suspiciously when I say that. Glenn. Thank you. Just briefly, um, I think a key word the Mayor has said is relationship. We're never going to have the, the perfect relationship with any government. The thing is we've just got to keep it going. And the way they see the world and the way we see the world won't always fit, but we, we just have to keep it going. Um, that, that's the important thing. And it's for the sake of the whole city we, we must do this. Ellie. 
Thank you. Just to go back to the specific issue about the elderly person's housing, because I just wanted to clarify this. What I'm not following, and I'm asking for clarification on, is the covenants that are in there already that protect this. Can they be overridden by what the LERP says? Th this is That's what we will get. Yeah, we'll get this in writing. I, Yeah, the, we will get a thank you. Yeah, the recovery, the, the the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act does not provide for that. So the the a recovery plan can um, well, the, the district plan. There there are na listed plans that cannot be inconsistent with a re recovery plan. So that wouldn't apply to private um, rights. Yeah. I've just got one other question from Mike, and it's in relation to 6.11. And Mike, while it, the agreement was there, be minor amendments. Um, that's on page five of our report, 6.11. Uh, may I take minor amendments? Clearly, these some of these minor amendments actually end up having a, a major impact. Or can you comment on that? And, and that's our concern. Uh, there are two provisions in the SUR legislation. Um, I mean, minor amendments are around correcting inconsistencies in the plan, and we're we're given the speed that it was produced, there are errors. Um, so minor amendments should be read in terms of the fact that legislation provides for that and they shouldn't fundamentally be changing the intent of the plan. The provision, there is a provision in the SIR legislation that allows the Minister to amend a recovery plan and that's where he would potentially be amending stuff that is material, but that he does have to consult on that. There is a process, including I think public consultation, Richard, that he has to go if he wishes to amend his recovery plan as opposed to correct his recovery plan. Just one other point to note is that there is a review of the LERP in about a year's time, so March 2015. So some of these issues may be addressed through minor amendments. They may be, council may be able to do them as a minor amendment through the normal RMA process, or there may be things which the Minister could change in the interim, or they could be picked up through the review of the LERP. So I'll, I'll move the motion. Um, do I have a seconder for it? Glenn Livingston. I'm not Councillor Manji. <laughs> Sorry, I just said I wasn't Councillor Manji. I just got written up as Councillor Manji. So, um, is there any debate? Yanni? Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate that we're just receiving this information, uh, this report for information, and there's no decisions being asked of us today other than simply to receive it. In effect, we're basically being told what government's done to our city, um, and I don't like that one bit, but we, as has been said, it's already been gazetted, uh, it's already been um, done to us, and there's really very little that we can change at this stage. I do think what's really important, though, is transparency around the processes going forward, and I think you know the difference between us and government, government do things in secret, we do things in public, and that is having a huge, that is causing stress on our communities who do not simply understand what government are doing and how they're making decisions because of the lack of transparency that exists. So when you talk to people in the Avonhead area around the you know, increased industrialisation out by the airport, when you talk to people around some of these areas where huge intensification as housing is, is going to occur, and the reality is that government have actually made many of these decisions without any public process. So you know, I'm really concerned about the loop. Um, I've had concerns from day one. I, I did my bit of compromising so that the council could uh, support it. I've learnt my lesson. I certainly won't be doing that again because the agreements we had with government, in my view, have been undermined. The fact that they've removed things like ass assessment criteria, I think, makes a, a mockery of the idea that somehow this is design-led. The reason that you would remove uh, assorted assessment criteria is to get away from design-led in fact, ironically, in one of the reports we've got on the agenda today, actually um, around the meadow fields, if you look at the best practice, what I think is quite a stunning proposal, around best practice of building neighbourhoods and communities, you have a mix of housing typology, no more than three houses in a row in areas where you've got a number of, of units. And just think back to some of the housing New Zealand days of the past, where you've got entire neighbourhoods that have the same type of character and housing stock that you know, don't certainly look very attractive, but certainly create 
a, a, a huge area that looks all the same, all monotonous. Why on earth would you take that rule out of the land use recovery plan to put in to protect, to get a better design-led recovery? I cannot understand it other than to say that it seems pretty clear to me that the barriers uh, that the government saw uh, around having more design-led approach, having a more community-minded uh, approach in terms of enabling us to discuss things with our community, uh, have been removed, whether it's the elderly person's housing or the intensification or the, the wider maps that have been put in uh, after we'd already had an agreement to have bigger than what we accepted maps originally. So, you know, I'm really not happy about this. I do think it's a, it's a sad day for our city. Again, things are being done to us. Uh, democracy has been um, taken away. People's right to be involved in the future of their communities and of our city is being removed. And I think it's a really sad day for Christchurch, um, but we have to accept this information. And again, the order in council needs to be released. Uh, we need to be able to tell our community what the parameters are of the order in council. I do not believe that government would ever have got away of rezoning the entire city. And in fact, I believe that um, that was just simply to scare us. In fact, they would have been judicially reviewed. It would have been challenged all the way to the Supreme Court if they'd tried to do something so outrageous, the community would not have tolerated it. And I think you know, that we should not think that they've done us a favour by um, you know, not doing that, because they would never have been able to do it, in my view. Uh, Phil Clearwater. I'm basically su support the recommendations. I'm, I'm just going to flag, though, an amendment, and it's this, that I think a lot of the concern has been expressed about councillors not having um, up-to-date information as this has progressed. It just seems to me that, and we're clear now on who is involved with this in internal steering group, and that's mainly um, at management level. And if some governance was part of that, so certainly sitting alongside that. So in fact, if we have, um, and it's not, I don't think it's any one committee, a, a group of councillors who actually work with that steering group to make sure, in fact, the things that Yani has concerns about, and a lot of councillors have expressed concerns about, so that in fact we, we get some traction on this, rather than kind of like accepting it only as, as Yani has indicated. So I'm, I'm just flagging that we have an amendment. Well, like, I, I, amend I'd be more than happy to um, incorporate an amendment into the into the resolution. Would, would the second to be happy with that? So, um, and uh, at, perhaps at the end, can you can you go down, add a new six point uh, one point seven, and put um, agree that a. Uh, what, um, a working group of councillors uh, work with the council steering group um, what, to, um, to oversee the uh, yeah to oversee the implementation Madam Chair just one thing I think to manage the implementation, this sounded like a Freudian slip, perhaps. But okay, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that just <laughs> brings me to my slight uncomfortableness with this. If you want to, for lack of a better word, I was going to say ball, stuff something up, you find a way to mix governance and management. The downfall of all the organisations, really, so often, is governance and management coming at loggerheads, and it, it does not, does not uh, lead to, um, to, to, to a better outcome. I do think that um, that we need to be overseeing this better, and I, so I don't agree with the intent of what you're saying, but perhaps just how we're going about it. I wonder if perhaps it's a reporting process or something Through like that that may be more appropriate. Through planning. Yeah, or even to all councillors, because I actually think that this, or, or a reporting process well, via um, the chief executive to the committee a, of the whole. Yeah, but a small, a small, nimble group of councillors. You know, I mean, I just think it's about building trust. So I agree with you. I, I agree quite with you. like, I quite like this idea. It doesn't interfere with the work of the council, but it does provide a, a direct link point, and I think gives people comfort both ways. So I think having um, councillors on a steering group, like a steering group, is inherently a management management-led approach to, to... Oh, well, I don't mind what the name of it is. But, um, can I just comment that, in fact, it's it's a steering group to it's a, and it's a working work alongside. Group to work with, it's a working yeah, group. Yeah. It's a working group. Is that OK? 
it says a working group to work with the council okay. steering group. Well, as long can as can I this, also can I also comment that as long as all of a sudden we're not you know having councillors on the management steering there was group. no intention no. of that and not, and that isn't the wording isn't that way. Can I just comment that unfortunately our current committees uh, in terms in terms of the the way our communities see us are not cutting the mustard. And I'm really suggesting there needs to be an overarching group to, at, at governance level to actually be involved um, with this whole issue rather than it, uh, just receiving reports from time to time. Yeah, the, uh, I, I certainly, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I think it's just about how you, we need to be very, very careful about how we go achieving that because we don't want to undo good work along you, the way. You, the, this is, you, you can think this, this can work with the steering group? Yes, so our steering group basically looks out because, I mean, this flows into lots of minor activities in the organisation. Yeah. I think we could work with a, certainly happy to work with a small steering group of councils. It would be useful if we could nominate who they were now so we could, rather than having to yep. potentially report back. Um, but I see this as basically being a sort of a, a touch point with a small group of councillors to keep a higher level of awareness of what's happening and to and to get some, some guidance where there are where there are issues that arise, so well, happy it looks, to do so. Well, it looks like the people that you've got on there are from Stratton Planning, um, Community Housing, um, who... So, I mean, perhaps, I mean, you, you could either... I don't know, just be one of them, just be the committee chairs. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, yeah. you could take the committee chairs of each of those committees. So it's um, Jamie Goff, Yanni Johansson, sure. um, uh, Phil Clearwater... Raph, Phil... Is that? Is it? And Glenn Livingstone. That's the four relevant. So just, yeah, a steering group of community board chairs. And I actually, slightly to one side, and sorry if I'm getting off track, but I think that's something I'd like to pursue a bit later on too, just to flag people, just community board, oh, sorry, com uh, committee chairs, perhaps yeah. having a, a meeting, then this might morph into that. Yes. But yeah, I've got a few yeah. ideas about that, and we'll raise that later. All right, so, I'll, um, so that's, now I'll put the um, whole motion. Um, because we've accepted that as part of the actual motion. So um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. So um, I think that we'll um, have a quick 10 minute break for morning tea. And if people could be back here at, it's 10.39, if they could be back here at 10 to 11. I'm going to